Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. We are so honored and excited to have Dr. Nicola Vino on today's show. She is a research neuroscientist and expert in the fields of nutrition, diet, and addiction. The work we get to do today would not have been possible without her pioneering research work in the field of food addiction. She has published over 90 journal articles related to diet, nutrition, overeating, and food addiction. She frequently presents these research findings at scientific conferences all over the world. Dr. Avina received a PhD in psychology and neuroscience from Princeton University. She's received numerous awards from prestigious associations for her research achievements. What we love about Nicole is she makes the complex scientific research she does on food addiction relatable and applicable. In her best selling books, she explains how we can apply this science to our everyday lives. She is a dominant food addiction voice in the mainstream media. Her TEDx talk called How Sugar Affects Your Brain was ranked number two most watched and has over 7 million views. You must check it out. Nicole believes in food as medicine, and as an expert in childhood nutrition and what to eat during pregnancy, she has authored several books on these topics that we will link in the show notes. Her latest book, What to Eat When You Want to Get Pregnant, offers revolutionary science-based advice for women and men who are either thinking about having a baby, already trying, or dealing with fertility issues. We hope you enjoy the show and stay tuned till the end. Her answer to our signature question is absolutely the best one by far. Well, thank you again so much for being here, Nicole. We are super curious. What made you decide to start researching sugar and food addiction? Well, it's actually an interesting story. So I got interested in food addiction when I was in graduate school at Princeton. And I had just started graduate school and I was raring to go. And I was working in a lab um, by a guy who is named Professor Bart Hobel. And we were just starting to talk about what I might do for my dissertation, what I might work on as my, you know, PhD project. And he had started doing some research looking at, you know, this idea of whether some foods could be addictive. And I thought that that was a really cool concept because it seemed like something that made a lot of sense because, you know, we have our normal, natural, healthy foods like fruits and vegetables and, you know, lean proteins and things like that. But then we have this whole other area of these designer foods that are, you know, highly processed, made in a laboratory. And to me, they seem very, very different than, you know, the types of foods that I think we're meant to eat. So it seemed like a really cool idea. And so that's really how I got into this. And it just kind of went from there. I never thought I'd still be working on my dissertation, you know, 15 years later, but here we are, we're still plugging away, doing studies, trying to better understand, you know, how foods affect the brain. So was there anything that you discovered while doing this research that made you immediately change the way you ate and the way you fed your family? I think, you know, as time goes on, I mean, I'm always learning, you know, there's new studies and things that are coming out almost daily. And I feel like all of that feeds into, you know, how I think about my own health and also how I, you know, think about my family's health. Certainly my kids, I have two little girls and my husband and I, you know, we really try to help them to better understand the type of food environment that we live in so that they can make good choices. And so really a lot of, you know, the information that I've been able to understand and digest over the years, I think has really just helped to inform us to better educate our kids and to, you know, talk to them about the dangers of eating too much added sugar and, you know, why maybe, you know, even if you're 
lean and thin right now, if you're eating a lot of sugar, it can catch up with you in a couple of years. And that might mean that you could develop diabetes or other health related concerns. And so I think that it certainly has impacted me significantly in terms of, you know, how I approach food, how I approach diet, and also how we just approach it in general when talking with our children. Yeah. And so that just makes a ton of sense. And we recently saw the Time Magazine article and, um, you know, it was just, it was so awesome to see the cover and to like see your name and in and, and them pulling out some of your research. And so we were wondering, you know, how has that been received, you know, by colleagues, by the public in general? Do you think that, you know, they were trying to minimize sugar? Like, tell us about that experience and, and what the, the outcome of that has been. Yeah. So this recent time special issue, I think, you know, it's, it's important because it's bringing to light a very important issue of, you know, what is sugar doing to our health? And I think that, you know, certainly my portion of, you know, the contribution to that piece was, I think, probably more on the side of saying, hey, we better be wary of this. And it's a public health concern. And we need to be doing something about it because we were quoted on, you know, our research on sugar addiction. But I personally think that, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. I think that, you know, there are still a significant number of people who don't take this seriously, who think that it's okay to overeat sugar and, you know, it's fine that it's in all these processed foods and that, you know, our kids are eating tons and tons of it every day. And I think that it really comes down to trying to educate people and help them to better understand the research and the science that's out there that is really setting up these warning signs for us to be aware that if we don't get a hold of this, it's going to catch up with us and the outcome is not going to be good. Have you received a lot of like pushback in the communities when these papers are being published just in terms of like big food, not wanting to your research to get out there? Uh, yeah, a bit. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we've published papers over the years where, you know, we'll have some pushback from the food industry or, you know, from the Corner Finers Association and different organizations such as that, that, you know, they, and I think that this isn't unique to our research. I think that, you know, all the different scientific disciplines, when somebody comes out with a paper that says something's bad, then, you know, the organization that's vested in that particular product is going to say, oh, no, that study wasn't right and they didn't do it right. And it's, you know, junk science or whatever they want to call it. And so we've had our fair share of that, um, but I feel like we've persevered and pushed through it. And, you know, I think it's often great to have, you know, healthy skepticism and science. We need that. That's what moves science forward. But I think that we've gotten to the point that when it comes to sugar addiction and sugar research, where we have so much evidence that points to the direction that is harmful to health, that it's addictive, that it leads to a variety of different health complications that, I mean, the naysayers voice has been, I think, pretty minimized at this point. Yes. I love that so much. And it's so true. I feel like it's, it's so scientifically validated these days. We don't need to argue this topic anymore. Let's move on to the next, right? I agree. Absolutely. Uh, We recently heard you speak in our holistic addiction medicine course, and you mentioned that the larger the portion you put in front of you, the more likely you are to consume more of it. Can you speak a little bit about the mechanism that's at work here and also to hedonic eating? Yeah. So portion control is always an issue. And I think that, you know, over time, we've seen that the portion sizes that are administered to people, whether they're at home or in a restaurant, have gotten larger and larger. We see this happen dramatically, you know, over the years since probably since the 1940s and 50s. And this is an issue because we have this psychological mechanism in place where we tend to think that what's put in front of us is what we should eat. The amount that's given to us is what we should eat. And there's been some classic studies that have been done that I often talk about when I give um, lectures on obesity to the class that I teach at Princeton University, where if you have people in a study and they're at a movie theater and you have, you know, people in one group, you give them a large popcorn, people in another group, you give them a smaller popcorn. And you also have the version of the study where one group, the popcorn is 14 days old. So it is like rotten, stale popcorn. You would not want to eat it. It wouldn't be tasty at all. Studies have shown that people will even overeat 
the rotten stale popcorn if they're given the larger portion size of it. And so they're going to eat more of something that actually doesn't even taste good just because they have a larger portion put in front of them. So portion sizes are difficult to regulate on our own. And, you know, what is put in front of us is often what we just default into eating. And, you know, that kind of speaks to the hedonic aspect of things when we talk about, you know, overeating sweets and overeating, you know, delicious foods, because a lot of times we're eating not just because we're hungry and we need calories, but for the pleasure, the hedonics, the drive that we get from eating something that tastes delicious. And that I think contributes to a significant amount of overeating that we see these days because people are unable to recognize their hunger cues. They're not able to recognize what it feels like to be hungry. I've talked to many, many people who will say, they don't even know what it feels like to be hungry. They've actually not experienced the sensation and in some ways that's good because that means that you know we have a surplus of food so people aren't starving but it's bad because you can you know not be able to regulate your food intake if you don't know what it feels like to be hungry and so having those internal cues to signal that it's time to eat are necessary and important and a lot of our food intake these days is driven by these external cues or these hedonically driven properties of the food So have you found that portion size piece of it to be true on foods that aren't hyper palatable, like popcorn, that makes sense, right? There's the butter, the salt, the fat, the whatever. But what about like, you know, if it were like eggs or steak and eggs or steak, eggs and bacon, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, is there anything to suggest that that's also a thing with real food or, or, you know, proper food? Yes. Even, you know, there's been studies that have looked at, you know, buffet style restaurants where you can measure, you know, how much people are eating in these different situations. And even for healthy foods, the more that's put in front of you, the more you're going to eat. So it can work to our advantage, right? So if you're, you know, getting a salad or something that's, you know, really healthy, like, yeah, that's great because we'll get more greens in and we'll eat more of it. But in most cases, it works to our disadvantage where, you know, people are overeating, you know, the foods that are not really that healthy. And that's really where the challenge lies. For sure. And and I guess I'm a little bit personally invested in this kind of topic because I identify as a volume addict. And that's just been true for me where I've gotten all those hyper palatable foods out, but then I still have to weigh and measure my meals because if you put it on this ginormous plate and fill the plate, I will eat it all, you know, so I have to be very careful about that. So certainly I just really appreciate you weighing in on that and just letting us know what the research says. So, you know, for food, ice, not only do we abstain from these drug foods, but we're also aware that there are like these psychological principles going on, right? Emotional, behavioral, cognitive, that kind of underlying that behavior, you know, can you speak to some of the psychology behind these eating behaviors that can lead us to eat off of our food plan without us even being aware of them? Yeah, there's so much that goes into this. And so I think this is one of the challenges that we face in terms of trying to help people who, you know, have a food addiction, how to overcome it, because there's really no recipe to do this, right? It's going to look different for every individual, depending on their history, depending on their emotional state, depending on their support system. And there's so much that goes into it beyond just the biology of it. And I think, you know, in terms of the psychology of it, one of the things that I think people really struggle with is to try to identify the triggers and what are the things in their environment that lead them to then want to overeat sugar or overeat, you know, processed foods. And what are the steps leading up to that point? And I think a lot of times, you know, those triggers, people hear the word trigger and they think it has to be a negative event, meaning like, oh, I had a really rough day at work. So I'm going to come home and have a big piece of cake or I'm going to, you know, reward myself in some way with food that's not always the case. People will often find that the trigger is, you know, oh, I had a great day at work. I'm going to reward myself with something or, oh, let's celebrate. It's somebody's birthday and, or, or, oh, I did great. I was eating well all week. So let me, you know, deviate a little bit this today and have something sweet that I want to reward myself. And so I think identifying those triggers and what is it about them and, you know, how can we change our mindset around that? How can we change the way we, you know, think and how we reward ourselves? And I, I often advocate, you know, for the nutritional consulting that I do with patients, you can't use food as a reward. That's not what it is. It's energy. It's nourishment. It's not a reward. You can reward yourself by going shopping or buying yourself a new purse. That's great. But don't use food as a way to self-soothe and to manage your emotions. And so, I think helping people to understand that 
the use of food is for nourishment and for energy, not for treating of your psychological aspects of what's happening in your life is really, really key for understanding. Yeah. I think that's so important, right? Like how are you using the food in your life? What is your relationship like with that food? And, you know, also is, is the trigger that you're trying to escape from what's going on in your life too right now. I'm also interested if you can speak to some of the research that you've done on non-nutritive sweeteners at all, and maybe what are your thoughts on caffeine and alcohol in relation to food addiction? Yeah. So the first point about non-nutritive sweeteners, this has been an area that's just growing and growing in terms of the research. And I think that it's a difficult area to navigate because there is a very heavy marketing that's going on among a variety of different food companies that are pushing many of these non-nutritive or alternative sweeteners, as they're being called, as you know, the replacement for sugar, the safe replacement for sugar. Now, my take on it is, and this is all based on the research, is that these non-nutritive and alternate sweeteners are a band-aid. They are the methadone of sugar. They are going to just basically be, you know, covering up the problem and not addressing it. And so I advise people to try to reduce the sweetness in their diet by, you know, cutting out these artificial sweeteners and these other sweeteners too. Because if you just like, you know, switch from sugar to, you know, artificial sweetener, you might think that you're solving your problem because they they don't have calories most of the cases, but you're actually not because you're still activating that brain reward system. The sweet taste is what drives the release of these neurochemicals in our brain that make us addicted. It's not, you know, what brand of sugar you're using or sweetener. It's actually just the sweet taste. So I often advocate that people just try to reduce the sweetness overall in their diet. And then that will really be beneficial in helping you to, you know, get off of sugar. Because if you just replace it with artificial sweeteners, you're just going to continue to crave sugar. It's not going to really help in the long run. I'm I'm sorry. What was the second part of your question? Just about the use of caffeine and alcohol if you're, you know, trying to recover from food addiction. Yeah. So these are, you know, it's difficult. I think that some, it depends on the individual. Some people find that they can dissociate caffeine, alcohol, and food into three different categories where there's no overlap. And for those people, that's great because they can still enjoy coffees and caffeine beverages and they can have a glass of wine. And, you know, it's really not going to have an impact on their diet per se, but there are other people who have blurred lines. And so a lot of times people, you know, when they're drinking alcohol, we have to remember, you know, alcohol is a, a depressant. It's going to, you know, shut our system down And a lot of times it shuts down our resolve. And so people start drinking alcohol and they say, oh, you know what? Let me have a snack and let me have a little munch of something here. And so I think that in that capacity, it can be, you know, very damaging. Also, depending on the type of alcoholic beverage you're drinking, you know, alcohol, most cases contain sugar. If you're drinking wine, you're drinking sugar. If, you know, you're having a mixed drink, you're drinking sugar. So we need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, many of these caffeinated beverages and many alcohol beverages contain added sugar. So if your goal is to get rid of sugar, then you need to get rid of those too. Now, I think there are alternatives. I think, you know, people who are coffee drinkers and just can't go without the caffeine and they enjoy that, then, you know, you need to come up with some alternatives, like maybe switching to black coffee. I often advise people to avoid energy drinks and, you know, those drinks that have mega doses of caffeine, because I think that they really set people up for failure when it comes to controlling your food intake, because you're going to have these, you know, spikes of dopamine release. You're going to have these spikes in your insulin levels because a lot of those caffeinated energy drinks have a lot of sugar in them. And then that's going to be followed by a crash that you're going to feel later on that can lead you to then maybe, you know, eat something that's really not in your plan. So I advise people to minimize where they can. Um, but you know, I think it really comes down to personal preference. Personally, me, I don't drink any caffeinated beverages. I drank a lot growing up of caffeinated beverages. Coffee was my thing. I was never seen without a cup of coffee. And about six months ago, I just like cold Turkey said, you know, I don't need this anymore. I I, I want to, why do I need this? I, I've been drinking coffee for so long. I don't even know what it's doing for me. And I just up and quit it. 
And I got to say, I feel great. I'm trying to get my husband to do the same thing, but he's not quite on board yet. So we'll see. But so I think, again, it comes down to individuals, but you do need to be mindful that they can interfere with, you know, quitting the sugar substances and sugar addiction for sure. Yeah. Clarissa and I decided for February to give up caffeine as well. And the first like 14 days for me were terrible. (laughs) I was irritable. I was just short tempered. Clarissa was going to like breach the border from Canada to come see me in Montana (laughs) for an intervention. Like it was a whole thing. And I didn't get any of the headaches really, but like the, I mean, some, but not like terrible, terrible, but definitely the irritability and just the like hating life. I even said to my husband one night, like, if this is life without caffeine, I don't want it. He's like, Oh Oh my my goodness, goodness, the dramatics. Mm -hmm. Um, but now, but now what 24 days in, you know, I don't remember what, what the caffeine was doing for me versus what I'm having now. So I don't necessarily see myself ever going back to it. It was just like a little experiment that we wanted to do for no February or whatever, but we made it kind of our own. And yeah, so it's just very interesting hearing, you know, your personal experience, but also what you have to say and what the research has to say about caffeine and how that can be so individualized. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's so important to do these little experiments on ourselves because, and I love how you said, you know, like you forgot what the caffeine was doing to you because the same thing happened to me. And I think, you know, we need to do this when it comes to our diet, like with sugar in particular, you know, you eat so much sugar, you go through this period of life where you're eating all these processed foods and you have to stop and think, what is this actually doing for me? Is this, how is this benefiting my health? Like, what am I getting out of this? And, you know, the hedonics and the pleasure, yeah, we know that that's really, you know, a a trick almost to kind of get us to eat more and more of it. And so if you put that aside, I think that that can really be an eye opener for people when they're trying to make that decision about, you know, quitting sugar or giving up, you know, processed foods. Absolutely. And I had that experience when I gave up the processed foods too. Within three weeks, my anxiety, my depression were so, they were gone. I mean, they still exist, but they're like manageable, right? They're things that I can do every day that manage anxiety, depression, where before I was on medications and all this other stuff. And just to have those gone and not to have that feeling every day of like just doom and gloom and want, want, like, how is my life going to, you know, whatever, just to remove the foods. It's amazing. So yeah. thank you again. Thank you for just reminding us that the research backs this up. It's not just me, you know, listeners, <laughs> there's, there's evidence out there that suggests give it a try and see what happens. So Clarissa and I both sit on the food addiction Institute, the board of food addiction um, Institute. And um, we're currently working um, to get food addiction or food use disorder, some name <laughs> into the DSM and the ICD. And so we're just kind of wondering, you know, do you believe that this is something that we'll get to see in our lifetime, you know, and if so, or if not, like what research do you think is still needed to kind of bolster that, you know, recognition? I think it's something we will see in our lifetime. I'm not sure if we're going to see it in our young lifetime. We might be a couple of old ladies by the time we see it. Um, And I think that that's in part because there are many players involved with this. And I think that, yes, there's a significant amount of research that's amassed over the past, you know, 15 years that has pointed to the fact that, yes, sugar is addictive. It can be addictive. We've been able to meet in my laboratory just from the research studies that we've done. And that's, you know, I'm one small laboratory. We have, you know, hundreds of other laboratories throughout the world that are doing research on this very same topic. We've been able to show that all the DSM criteria for substance use disorder have been met when the substance is sugar. Um, We've shown that in laboratory animals. We've also um, published a significant number of clinical studies showing that sugar produces signs of addiction in humans. We've seen that it's, you know, showing changes in the brain that are similar to what happens when someone's addicted to drugs. Again, we've seen this both preclinically in our animal models and also clinically using brain imaging studies. And so I think that it's not a matter of do we have enough evidence. I think it's a matter of how is this going to fit with the narrative? And I think that, you know, we do have a lot of pushback from the food industry. There are lobbyists that are involved that, you know, don't want to see this happen. They don't want food to be classified as, you know, an addictive substance because it can hurt their profits. And that's something that is obviously a concern. I think that for me, the big challenge that I see with getting this into ICD and DSM is the fact that the word food is too broad. 
And, you know, where do you draw the line? Like with, with drugs of abuse, it's pretty clear. Like we have, you know, schedule one, schedule two, schedule three, we, we have classified the drugs that are abusable and we can very easily, you know, I could point to cocaine and say, yes, that's an addictive substance, alcohol. Yes. That's an addictive substance. But with food, how do we do that? I mean, are Oreo cookies addictive, but what if they're like low fat or what if, you know, you make cookies at home and you don't use sugar, you use like raisins to sweeten them. So I feel like there's a lot of what ifs and it's not as clear cut as we would like it to be. And that's where I feel like we have a little bit of work to do to try to get this recognized on a, a more broad level. But I do think it will happen. I just think that it's going to take a little bit more time to get clarity about what we're asking when we talk about foods being addictive. Another thing is, you know, I think people are concerned about, well, what is the, what are the implications of it? If we say that foods are addictive, does that mean we're going to be taxed on them more? You know, are we going to have a sin tax? Like we have sin taxes for alcohol. You know, there's a, a premium on cigarettes that you have to pay extra to smoke cigarettes because it's, you know, the whole idea is that these taxes are going to reduce people from wanting to use these substances because they're bad for them. And so if you have to pay extra in taxes, maybe you won't use them. And, you know, the sin taxes, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. When it comes to sugar, I, I don't see them really working. There's been some different cities that have, you know, tried to implement a sugar tax and the effects have not really been all that great in terms of reducing use. So I think that's another, you know, question we have is, well, what's going to happen if, you know, foods are addictive or we going to be locked up if we get caught with cookies in our car like what's the what is the end point and i think those are the questions that we really need to come up with good answers for to see this happen yeah, I definitely think that once the logistics get a little bit more worked out and we specify whether it's like processed food addiction or sugar addiction or carbohydrate addiction, it's still, even within those categories, it can still just be so wide. I was wondering if you could speak to a little, we often run into a bit of, I, I wouldn't say defense, but you know, when you're talking eating disorder camp versus food addiction, they're very much moderation versus abstinence. And so do you think that there will ever be a time where the eating disorder camp can accept food addiction? And also, what are your thoughts on if somebody has quit sugar and they're a food addict, do you think there will be a time in their life they can reintroduce it again? Well, to speak to your question about, you know, eating disorders versus food addiction and in terms of the sort of mindset around treatment, I think that it's it's a very different category. I also think, you know, we need to throw in sort of a third group, which is addiction medicine. And I think, you know, traditionally eating disorders have a treatment ideology that avoids restraint because one of the key characteristics of eating disorders is extreme restraint that people impose on themselves to reduce calories, to adhere to these, you know, exercise regimens that end up being harmful to, you know, engage in binging and bulimia type purging behaviors. And so the whole idea of telling someone who has an eating disorder that they should, you know, restrain further just kind of flies against everything that, you know, the field has kind of developed into. And so I, I understand that portion of it. And I think that that's perhaps a good mentality to have for certain types of eating disorders, like for, you know, anorexia nervosa, for bulimia nervosa, you know, if restraint is the core problem, we obviously don't want to give more to that by telling someone to restrain even more. But I would argue that perhaps it could work to the advantage of patients. If, you know, I still, if someone tells me that, they don't want to eat Oreo cookies, then don't eat them. The, the, you know, to me, it's, it's really, you know, if you're telling someone that they shouldn't eat something that's unhealthy, that's great. Don't eat it if it's unhealthy. So I still don't really advocate, you know, the idea that for eating disorder treatment that, you know, all foods are safe, all foods are good. That's not true. All foods are not good. There are plenty of foods in our food supply that are bad for you and you shouldn't eat them. So if, if you don't want to eat them, then don't eat them. So that part of it, I, I don't necessarily agree with the traditional treatment. Now, addiction medicine, you know, has this idea that if you're addicted to drugs, you have to abstain. So they're kind of the opposite of eating disorders where they're imposing more restraint. And there are some areas of addiction medicine that, you know, are a little bit 
more lenient, like looking at a harm reduction approach where, you know, maybe the idea isn't to completely restrain yourself from the drug, but like maybe we could get it into acceptable levels of use or acceptable amounts of use. So often with alcohol intake, for instance, you know, some people are able to just cold turkey quit alcohol and that's what they need to do because they can't restrain themselves. They can't just have, you know, one or two drinks. Other people are able to employ a harm reduction approach where maybe they are drinking too much, but then they are able to reduce the harm by cutting back. And maybe they're not drinking, you know, most nights they're drinking a few nights and they're not having, you know, three glasses of wine, they're having two. And so those treatments can work and they can be very successful. And I I feel like food addiction is in the middle. I feel like we're drawing a little bit from the eating disorders treatment side of it. And we're also drawing from the addiction medicine treatment side of it. And I think that, you know, the combination of, you know, the therapy options and things that have worked and not worked in those different fields are really what can inform the best treatments for food addiction. So, I mean, I've worked with people who, you know, are abstainers, they don't have any sugar, they're, you know, very carefully weighing and measuring their food, and that's what works for them. But I've also worked with people who are still eating sugar, but they've been able to get it down to a point where they have are managing the harm. They don't, they no longer have, you know, insulin resistance because of it. They're no longer overweight because of it. They're no longer, you know, finding that they're these uncontrollable binges. So I think both can work. It's just a matter of finding what's going to work for the individual. Definitely. And I think we experience that as well of working with our clients that we have the clients that absolutely have to abstain 100% um, and they have to cold turkey it because the uh, negative outcomes are just so severe where, you know, where they're at kind of deal. But then we also have those clients where it's more of a slower approach. It's that harm reduction where obviously with harm reduction, the, the point is to have zero harm, which would absolutely always be end game abstinence, but certainly not everybody always makes it there. But if we're always working in that direction and they're having good effect, then, you know, have we improved quality of life and, and, you know, whatever, like you were saying, like the, the, they're not having the insulin resistance, they're not having the blood sugar swings they're whatever. And so, yes, absolutely. I think you're right. We do draw from both kind of, we're somewhere in the middle, aren't we? And, and that can sometimes be confusing for our clients. And so we talk a lot about that confusing stuff with our clients because of that. So thank you so much. We're going to switch gears just a little bit because we're super interested to hear your input on the new, the recent nutritional guidelines, because we know that they were recommended to drop like down to like 6% of our, you know, added sugars or whatever. And I think they kept it at 10 or they dropped it down to 10. I don't remember what it had been, but, but anyways, we were interested to hear your take on, you know, the new guidelines and, and, you know, was there any disappointment or, or what are the next steps? Yeah, I was disappointed. I think most people in the scientific community and the medical community were pretty disappointed because the advisory board that was put together, which is comprised of doctors and scientists that, you know, make these recommendations, did recommend that the guidelines be changed to have no more than 6% of your daily calories coming from added sugar. The present guidelines had been no more than 10%. And, you know, based off of the research and, you know, what we know about the effects that sugar can have on our bodies and and our brain and our health in general, it was decided that it should be reduced even further. And I agree with that. I think most people do, but for reasons that are still not quite clear, it was not pushed forward. It was, you know, the, the decision was made. And I believe that, you know, the um, argument was that they didn't believe there was sufficient evidence to back it up. But I I would say that there's plenty of evidence that, you know, it was a a political issue was the reason why it wasn't reduced further. You have to keep in mind, you know, the food industry has a big foothold in what happens with these types of things and guidelines and such. And so um, I think that, you know, cutting it down from 10% to 6% would have been a big feat, especially because, you know, when the nutrition guidelines came out in the last iteration, that was when we were first introduced to this idea of even having a limit on how much added sugar we should have. There was no limit in terms of the recommendations before that point. And so now we do have this recommendation and the food companies had to scramble. They had to reformulate a lot of products to get the sugar down. Keep in mind, it's the products are still as sweet. They basically just reduce the amount of, you know, sugar, sugar, and added in a bunch of artificial sweeteners and other alternative sweeteners that don't count as sugars. 
So be mindful if you're trying to reduce the sweetness in your diet, just because something says that it's no sugar or low sugar now, it's a lie. (laughs) And that there's plenty of sugar, plenty of sweeteners in there. Um, They're just not going to fall under the umbrella term of sugar that has been defined by, you know, the USDA. So we'll see what happens next go around. I would imagine that we'll see it reduced because at that point we'll have drastic number of people and children with diabetes, with all these other health concerns that I think the data will drive us toward having to reduce the amount of sugar even further. Yeah. It is so sad that our children's health is going to be the way we're going to determine that that policy was wrong and it really should have been implemented because, you know, all of us spend so much time in the research and knowing about how dangerous the food items are out there. But a lot of doctors who are even just, you know, providing their patients with information do it based on the nutritional guidelines. And if those are not enforced, then our children are going to suffer for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, those nutritional guidelines are important because schools utilize them when, you know, developing menus for school lunch programs. And so these aren't just kind of guidelines that are put out there that, yeah, you can listen to them if you want to or not. Many children, and you know, this is an important issue. Many children get three meals a day from their school. And so if those are the guidelines that are being implemented, that means that just that much more sugar is allowed into these kids' meals. And I don't agree with that. I think that that should be changed. So you're a parent and Molly is a parent. And I know that a lot of the individuals that we work with are parents as well. What are some of the common psychological and nutritional mistakes that parents can make while raising their children that also inadvertently promote unhealthy eating habits? And then how do we actually talk to our children about eating healthy, quote unquote, healthy foods? Yeah, great questions. And so this is actually something that I talk about a lot and I speak about a lot in my book, what to feed your baby and toddler. And part of the reason why I wrote that book was because I felt like, you know, as a parent and as a, you know, person in the nutrition field, I felt a little bit, you know, unarmed when it came time to talk to my kids about food and to, you know, teach them about what's healthy, what's not, and, you know, how to open that conversation, how to start it. And I think that a lot of it really starts with what you're feeding your baby. What When you first start to feed your child, you know, what are the types of foods that you offer? How do you encourage them to try new foods? How do you, you know, work to get a variety of different foods in their diet? And we know that that first thousand days of life, that point from conception through age two is just critical for not only, you know, development in terms of cognitive functioning and immune system health, but also just in terms of health outcomes later in life. And so it's very important that we make sure that, you know, what we're feeding our little ones, what we're teaching them from an early age, you know, is really held on to. And I think that, you know, some of the tips that I often give people and talk a bit about in the book are you want to teach your child to be their own police, right? We don't want to, you know, impose these restrictive, rigid rules. Like you can't have this, you can't have that. It's more about getting your children to understand it from a place of health and from understanding that it has nothing to do with what your body looks like. It has to do with what your body feels like and what's inside your body, because you can't see if your liver has fat on it. You might be, you know, nice and and lean and trim, but that doesn't mean that you have a license to go, you know, eat cookies and cupcakes all day long because you could be having fat on your body, but it's just inside in your organs, which is the most dangerous place for it to be. And so you can't go by, you know, how you look or, you know, how much you weigh to determine whether or not, you know, you're quote unquote healthy. And so I think explaining that to kids and and sort of helping them to understand that, you know, it's okay to have sweets in moderation, but you need to show them what moderation is. And so, you know, one of the things that we often do is, in my family at least, is, you know, we have this rule, like if it's somebody's birthday at school, yeah, if you want to have their cupcake, go for it. That's great. Celebrate with your friends, but you're not having dessert because you had dessert already. You had it at lunch. And so a one dessert a day policy is what we have. And I think that that has worked. And, you know, even my five-year-old, she'll come home and say, oh, I'm not having, you know, dessert tonight because it was Alice's birthday and and her mom sent in cupcakes. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. So helping kids to put their own limits and recognize that, you know, 
they have to understand that they are in control of their health and that they have to make good decisions about it. I think that a lot of parents struggle with, you know, being too restrictive or too lenient. And I think that it's really important to just try to find that middle ground and that happy medium. Yeah. So oftentimes our parents, you know, our clients who are parents come to us and they want to know, like, how do I, how do I do this? Allow my children to police themselves, but balance that with, are they being too picky or right? Like they're, they're, they're policing themselves, but they're only picking these, you know, things that are making me cringe on the inside because I see the outcome, you know, 20 years from now, because it's my lived experience, you know? So, so I guess what we're kind of wondering is like, how can you speak briefly to the science of like how exposure to certain types of foods early on in life help create those healthy eating behaviors later? And, and maybe how do parents help navigate that, that self-policing of the children? Do you have like tools or, or ideas you give them? Yeah. So I talk about this a lot and what to feed your baby and toddler that there's a lot of research that's gone on that has suggested that early exposure to a variety of foods will encourage trying those foods later in life. And there's been some classic studies that have been done um, looking at, you know, even passive exposure to things like carrots from breast milk. If, you know, a pregnant woman, one study that I recall, pregnant women are eating carrots or have carrot juice to drink, then they're breastfeeding their babies. The babies are then more likely when it comes time to eat actual food to be acceptive of eating the carrots because they've had this, you know, passive exposure to it where they've had like, you know, traces of it in their breast milk. And so these things are important. And I think, you know, nutrition during pregnancy and during, you know, those breastfeeding years can be very important for what's going to happen later on. Now, if you're beyond that point, then, you know, there are still some things that you can do. I think, you know, encouraging variety is important. What I like to do, one of the tactics that utilizes in my house is, you know, I, I select the menu. I am the chief chef of this home and I do let my junior chefs have some input on what the side dishes will be so that, you know, people feel like they have some skin in the game and they're just not being told, here's what you're eating. They have options. And so, you know, the rule is, you know, you have to try everything, just take little bites. If you don't like it, then you don't have to eat it, but you have to at least try it because you don't know if you like it yet. And I think, you know, getting kids involved with cooking and letting them have some say in what the meals are going to look like is important. I don't let them just, you know, pick anything they want as the side. I will say it has to be a healthy side. You know, here's three vegetables, pick which one you guys want. And so then they at least feel like, you know, they have some control and ownership in what we're having. I think that, you know, kids are naturally picky. That's, you know, if people are concerned about that, that's just, that's just part of having kids is they're picky. (laughs) That's not necessarily a bad thing. We're designed biologically to be neophobic. That means afraid of new things. And when it comes to food, yeah, it can actually be a survival mechanism to be afraid of new foods. Because if you eat a food that you've never had before and it makes you sick, you could die. I mean, people, you know, to this day die of, you know, eating food that's poisoned and whatnot. So I think that just from a biological standpoint, we evolved to be a little bit wary of new food and show that manifests more in children because that's just how their biology works. And so I don't think that it's a bad thing if people have picky eaters. I think you just need to work with them to better understand, you know, why they don't like certain foods or why are they unwilling to try. And it can be frustrating as a parent. I have had a picky eater on my hands, so I can certainly speak from experience that it's frustrating, but you have to look at it as you're teaching your child something very important, an important skill set for life and, and helping them to work through something. And so I think that it's just something that you have to put the time into to better understand their their hesitancy to try new foods. That's great. That's some good tips there for sure. So you have a new book coming out called What to Eat When You Want to Get Pregnant. Uh, So you've worked with the babies, worked with the breastfeeding, worked with the toddlers. Now you're taking it one stage earlier. Can you tell our listeners why you thought it was so important to write this book and how food can benefit your pregnancy experience? Absolutely. So what to eat when you want to get pregnant will be out April 1st and it is available for pre-order right now. And it was really a book that kind of came out of the books that I had previously written. So what to feed your baby and toddler. I also wrote another book called what to eat when you're pregnant. 
And it's really this whole idea about how, you know, food can have such a significant impact on our health. It can have a significant impact on health outcomes for pregnancy. And when I was doing research for those books, I also started to, you know, think about the fact that, you know, there's so much in our food environment that can actually have an impact just on our ability to get pregnant. And, you know, this goes beyond the sort of negative things that we hear a lot about, about, you know, toxins in the environment and, you know, how we have all these different pesticides and chemicals in our food supply, but extending that to just better understand, you know, what are the nutrients that are in different foods that can have a positive impact on fertility that can help, you know, with making sure not only, you know, women's fertility health is good, but also for men. And I think that, you know, it's really interesting to look at this from the standpoint of, you know, you can have some control. I struggled with infertility when we were trying to have my second daughter, And one of the things that I really recall from that experience was that there felt like this extreme lack of control, like, no, like life was happening to me. It wasn't, I wasn't living my life. I was, you know, just waiting around for whatever was going to happen to happen. And that's a really terrible feeling. And I felt like this book can hopefully give people some control, can help people. Yes, it's not going to, you know, guarantee you're going to get pregnant, but it can help you to get your body into the best shape. It can help you to understand the nutrients that you need in your diet to, you know, have healthy eggs, you know, have, you know, healthy uterus, have healthy sperm. And I think that it can be beneficial even for people who aren't struggling with infertility. You know, the book is designed to be for anybody who's just interested in how food can impact your fertility. So if you're thinking about maybe having a baby, you know, next year or the year after, now's the time to think about what you're eating because these changes aren't going to happen overnight. And the types of foods that we consume that can have a negative impact on our fertility, you know, are not just going to disappear if we, you know, start eating healthier tomorrow. It can take some time for these things to happen. So um, yeah, I'm really proud of the book and and I'm hoping it can help people and just help educate people further about, you know, the role that nutrition plays in our health and specifically in how it can help with getting pregnant. I'm super excited for it because I am a person who also struggles with infertility. I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome back in 2010 or 2011. So before I even got pregnant with my first child and, you know, it's so interesting. I had to do my own research, right? Like they were like here throwing medications or, Oh, it'll just take some time. Right. And uh, so I had to do my own research and I went gluten and dairy free. And then in combination with some of the other things, right. That helped the process along for sure. But then the thing was I developed gestational diabetes because nobody talked to me about the food and I developed gestational diabetes. And then they had me eating 150 grams of carbohydrates a day, which keep in mind, that was probably significantly less than what I had been eating, but here, you know, 150 grams of carbohydrates a day. And, and you know, and I had to test my blood sugar and stuff like that. So it's not like I was out there eating cake and brownies and cookies and that kind of thing. It was, you know, like beans and rice and whatever, but quinoa, I remember all the things too. And it's, and so I just think it's so needed because nobody is talking to us about the food. Nobody is using food as medicine, as a first line of defense. You know, anytime I go to the doctor and I have, you know, an issue, nobody's saying, you know, let's talk about what you're eating. Never. That just doesn't happen. And so I'm just, like you said, like this book is about, this is for anybody really who wants to know about how to just improve our overall like health in general. And so I, again, I'm so excited for that. So thank you for writing that book and I'm excited. I'm going to go pre-order it. Thank you. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. And I think you're so right. You're absolutely right that the doctor never asks you, well, what'd you have for lunch today? Like they ask you, you know, all these other questions, but the most fundamental thing that we actually can control that can have such an impact on our health outcomes is just not discussed. And that's what are we eating? And, you know, I, I think that it's really a failure in modern medicine that we aren't using preventative medicine via nutrition in the way that we should be. It can empower us to just control so much about our health, so much of the disease and the conditions that are out there are diet related. It all comes back to what we eat and people can control, for the most part, people can control that, but it's just not something that modern medicine has, I think, adopted yet. And so hopefully that'll change at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And and maybe that comes with the gui- the guidelines, the dietary guidelines changing. Maybe that comes with, you know, the DC- DSM and the ICD, you know, 
stuff for sure. But, you know, I also think there's this general, um, like just trust it's in a package, like the government would let us eat it if it was bad for us kind of feel to it, you know? And so I think it's just that reminder of like, actually it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with profits and it's generally accepted as safe, you know? And so if you're a person that it's not safe for, then don't eat it. Right. Like they just always put the onus back on the individual. Like, well, that's your problem, not ours. We've done everything we were supposed to do to keep you safe. So good luck to you. Right. Again, thank you so much for just shedding all that light with your continued research. And thank you for making it a 15 year project. For sure. <laughs> because again, like we, I don't know about me, but I or about Clarissa, but for me, I refer to your research often because it just, it, you're so clear on the results that over and over again, you're showing like, listen, we are wired for these specific things. And, you know, we can do things like you said, like, we don't have to just sit back and let it happen to us. There are things that we can do. So, um, so I just, again, wanted to throw in and make sure you knew how much we appreciate um, that for you. So, um, so other than the book, we know there's maybe a symposium coming up. So we want to hear about that, but how do, what's, what are the next projects you're working on and how do our listeners find you? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, if people are interested in learning more about me and the research that we're doing and different things that are happening, you can go to my website. It's www.drnicoleavina.com. I'm also on social media as Dr. Nicole Avina. So check that out too. Um, so next steps, you know, I don't know, there's always so much going on. Um, I, you know, definitely, you know, be focusing a bit over the next couple months on the new book coming out, and I'm um, continuing to do the research that we're doing in the lab, looking, you know, at the neuroscience of overeating and trying to, you know, publish a couple of papers that were kind of lagging back from 2020. And then, you know, just really keeping going, um, you know, keeping the momentum going, doing a lot of, you know, educational seminars and different events in 2021 to really just try to spread the word about, you know, how we can help people make better food choices. What are some of the tools that we can give them and, you know, how we can really just change the world, change this whole mindset around how we look at food. Because I think that that's what we need to do. We, we really need to take this seriously. And, you know, we've been talking about it for years, but now we've really got to do it. And I think that that's one of my goals for, you know, this year is to get to a point where we're able to, you know, have more and more people on board with this idea that we need to take control over what we're eating because it's going to kill us if we don't. Yeah. I'm very excited. I'm attending the uh, symposium, the binge eating disorder food addiction symposium in March. So I think it'll be, I just love the idea of getting dietitians, eating disorder, behavior specialists and food addiction all in the same arena. So we can just talk about the different treatment modalities. I just think it's such a necessary piece and I'm so grateful for you for taking that on. Oh, so thank you. Yeah, happy to do it. We have a signature question, and it is, if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about food addiction, what would it be? Well, I think for me, per- this is very unique to me. I would have told my younger self that you're going to be studying this for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, I, I don't necessarily, you know, it's funny, you think back to these like random interactions you have with people and when I was in graduate school, I remember I had um, a, a senior colleague who, you know, he was an older guy and he had been doing research in the lab for many years. And I remember he just made this comment to me, like about, you know, I was talking about maybe looking, doing some studies, looking at alcohol use and, you know, kind of a little bit out of the food addiction box. And he said, if I were you, I'd study food addiction for the rest of my life. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But I I am. And I, it, it's true. There's just, you know, I opened up a can of worms, I think when I started doing this research and there's just so much more to be done. And so I think if I had to go back and tell my younger self anything, it would be that get used to this because this is, this is where we're staying. <laughs> Oh, I love that answer, Nicole. That's so far the best answer we've had to the signature (laughs) question. That's number one. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're so excited to pick up your book and we'll put all of your uh, contact links in the show notes as well. Okay, great. Thank you. I was happy to be here. Great to speak with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.